We are live. Good evening, everybody. Welcome you to this uh, special city council meeting. Mr. Clerk, if you please confirm the roll has been taken. Through the chair, roll call has been taken. All right. Does any member of council have a pecuniary interest they need to declare regarding the item that's on tonight's agenda? If so, please physically raise your hand. So we'll move right into uh, delegations. Prior to the hearing of delegations, I'd like to remind those in the meeting that the following rules of decorum as set forth in the city's procedural bylaw apply. One, no person shall display any sign, banner, or placard in the meeting. Uh, other than materials that in the opinion of the chair are legitimate audiovisual aids necessary in connection with any presentation to be made to council. All persons present shall use polite and respectful language and shall refrain from the use of any language or the making of any gesture that is disrespectful or offensive. All persons addressing council shall speak only in the subject in debate and shall not speak in any other subject. No person shall applaud participants in debate or engage in conversation or behavior that may disrupt the proceedings of the meeting. So we have four registered delegations and one presentation on tonight's agenda. Uh, we received one late delegation requesting to speak to item 5.1. Prior to moving the delegations, we'll need a motion to waive the rules uh, to allow the late delegation. Do I have a motion to waive the rules? Moved by Councillor Samuel, second by Councillor Carpenter. Any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, just a reminder that that does, uh, it will require two thirds vote since we're waiving the rules. So Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. The motion to waive the rules is lost on a record vote of four to six. Members of council voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Sullivan, Carpenter, Samuel, and Toborg. Members opposed, Mayor Davis, Councillors Socoli, Caputo, Sless, Marn, and McCreary. All right, so we'll now move forward into the delegations. Uh, Matt Allman, if you please come forward, uh, begin your delegation, and you have 10 minutes inclusive of questions. And so if you'd come up and just have to press the button. Yeah, there you go. There we go. So not only is this my first time doing this, but I got to go first tonight. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, council, I've, I'm born and raised here in Brantford. I've, I just celebrated my 40, 40th birthday in June. So I've seen it go from what some may call it a sleepy little farm town to our Silent Hill era through the Laurier resurgence and quite possibly in the next few years, I'm hoping a renaissance downtown. Uh, the Brantford Bulldogs didn't necessarily fall into the, the city's laps. There's been a lot of planning behind the scenes, but from the outside looking in, a lot has happened in a short amount of time that could give the illusion that some decisions are being rushed. When the term agreement was made to bring the Bulldogs here, part of it was a promise to do a deep dive in what it would encompass to not only development wise, but financially to build a new home for the Bulldogs and what all that would entail. We're a growing city of 100,000 strong now. We're facing some of the same growing pains that similar size cities are faced every single day. A yes for this project to move forward or moving towards the next steps rather is not a no to supporting any other issues we have in this city. We hear a lot of talk about our hospital situation and a lot of the misconception is that the money spent on a complex like this might take away from money spent on issues like, uh, or sorry, projects like the BGH. I'm hoping that misconceptions like this can be cleared up during this process and the ongoing communication that the city's been providing through its various channels. Great job, by the way, Maria. I think it's important. It's the important thing to remember here as Brantford's growing, we need to address obviously some of the concerns, the issues ha that a lot of citizens have, but we also need to address what some may consider the lack of amenities needed in a city of over a hundred thousand people now. This is not the same city it was 40 years ago. The city is headed in the right direction despite some of the major issues and concern that citizens have brought forward. However, $140 million, the price tag of, of, of the proposed sports and entertainment complex isn't going to solve any of these problems overnight. Simply put, the urgency tonight is the timing needed for this decision. The Bulldogs need an answer as to whether or not this is gonna happen. If that answer is yes, most likely they stay here long-term. 
but that's not, but it's not just about hockey. From a sporting perspective, there's basketball, lacrosse, turf sports, concerts, orchestras, comedy festivals, trade shows, conventions. If you build it, they will come is the quote that's made famous by Field of Dreams. And quite honestly, it could apply here. In my opinion, Brantford has been considered a drive-by, a drive-through city for much too long. Sure, we're the tournament capital of Ontario. We also host some pretty great events. Crew Fest, which saw 8,000 people take to Lions Park, for example, to enjoy a concert. The city is capably, capable of being a destination city. In order to become a destination city, in order to get the tour, tourism dollars coming in here regularly, we need a venue that allows for a multitude of different types of events and shows to be hosted. Again, this isn't just about hockey. This is about giving Brantford something to be proud of, giving Brantford the capability to welcome these type of events on a regular basis, and giving Brantford and our downtown a much needed shot in the arm economic, economically. Some of the financials I've read in the report estimate a $600,000 loss annually by this proposed arena. You could look at that as a big chunk of change, but when you start looking at some of the other projected numbers that it injects into the Brantford economy, a quarter of a million dollars in wages annually, four million in tourism money spent here annually in town, that projected $600,000 loss annually looks like an investment back into our economy with the opportunity to build on future revenues to shrink that investment number even further. Not only would it bring tourism dollars from other cities into Brantford, but also in some instances might help keep some of our own citizens tourism money from leaving the city as well. Imagine if we didn't have to go to Hamilton, London, Guelph, Kitchener, Cambridge to see some of the shows and events and concerts that we could host here in the city with this venue. It's not just about hockey. It's not just, it's not hockey versus the hospital or hockey versus the homeless or hockey versus a need for more infrastructure in the city. It's about making a decision on a venue that could be a big part of the revitalization of our downtown. There's a lot of exciting projects being proposed. And as a lifelong citizen, it's a really encouraging thing to see council behind them. I hope that council takes the information that will be presented tonight and make the decision to move this forward to the next steps and show this city that they are all in on Brantford's future as a destination city. I love this city and I look forward to it to being a very bright future for Brantford. Thank you. So Mr. Rome, we might have some questions for you. All right. Um, any questions, Councillor Carpenter? No, you said the phrase all in. Yes. At any cost? At any cost all in at any cost like it is the cost not what the how we pay for it is that not important yeah absolutely the the expenses done on a project like this is going to be significant for sure but if the value we see in return as a whole is much greater than that then yeah i think that's a great investment so so we, we're not you're not looking for the taxpayers to fund it out of their pocket by with an increase in tax levy i think if you take a look at the majority of the uh, similar buildings that are being that's from what's being proposed here that have been built over the last 20 years a lot of them have been publicly funded through taxpayer dollars there is opportunity for sponsorship there's opportunity for uh, other groups or companies to provide uh, through fundraising efforts as well do you think the hockey club itself should have some skin in the game i think if they want to make brantford their long-term home then I think it's reasonable to ask them for, yeah, ask them to put some skin in the game, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Any other questions? Seeing none. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ellman. Thank you. So the uh, next delegation I think is coming to us virtually, Mr. Uh, Prang, Chamber of Commerce. Good evening. Good evening. Frank, if you would uh, please introduce yourself and you'll have 10 minutes inclusive questions to speak to this matter. Okay, good, e good evening. Uh, David Prang, uh, the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, Brantford Brant. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to share a few, uh, uh, share my support uh, and the support of the business community uh, behind this great initiative. Um, I think this is an opportunity for, uh, for City Council to 
uh, believe and show belief in, in Brantford. Uh, they've done in, uh, in a very short amount of time, uh, been able to solicit uh, both the, um, the qualitative uh, in terms of um, how the community has supported the, uh, the, the opportunity at the Civic Center uh, through the Brantford Bulldogs uh, with the season tickets, the quickness of the, the sales of the season tickets and the, uh, the regular support of, of the events there. Uh, as well as the the qualitative uh, or the quantitative rather in terms of um, the the business case behind uh, such a great uh, new and exciting concept. Uh, this is an opportunity to for the city of Brantford uh, to to show that they believe in Brantford, believe in the opportunity, the growth that's going to happen uh, both in the city of Brantford, the county of Brant, uh, Six Nations of the Grand River, our friends at the Mississaugas and the Credit First Nation. Uh, and if you you know see where where vehicles are coming from, uh, the opportunity coming to a game recently coming from the south, uh, south into the city, uh, the number of uh, vehicles and, and passengers and that coming from uh, Haldeman and Norfolk area. Uh, so this is, while this is a city council, city of Brantford's initiative, uh, the opportunities for this region uh, where the, the chamber represents businesses in the city of county, it's city of Brantford and the county of Brant, uh, this is an opportunity for our region uh, to develop and grow economically. And uh, certainly we're already going to do that uh, through the growth in the city and the county uh, projected through 2051 uh, through both the city and the county's official plans. Uh, this is this opportunity is a catalyst for economic development, uh, another catalyst for economic development in our downtown. Uh, as chair of the downtown brand for BIA for six years, I know that this is an opportunity within the Urban Growth Center uh, to densify uh, and concentrate development, to create more walkable communities, uh, to activate elements of the Parks and, Rec Parks and Recreation Master Plan, Waterfront Master Plan, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, consistent with the city's economic development strategy, uh, it's sport tourism strategy and, uh, and the, the opportunity to, uh, create an, an exciting, uh, opportunity within, uh, within an area that, uh, you know, desperately needs some revitalization that's been needing it for, uh, for a long time now. So, um, I mean, I see the, the, uh, and Mr. Allman had some great points as well in terms of. Uh, the, the costs and the exciting, uh, exciting opportunities that are not just sport related, but also entertainment. Uh, we, we have a really uh, amazing uh, opportunity within that district in terms of the density that's about to um, about to happen in terms of pre-approved and potential and proposed uh, uh, apartment and residential complexes. I had the opportunity to talk about the, the zoning bylaw uh, earlier today with with city staff uh, and uh, you know, the, the opportunity to consider uh, towers, not just uh, single family homes anymore, but uh, high density um, apartment uh, and, and condominium complexes uh, within that area as well. So I encourage the uh, the council to um, to believe in Brantford and show that uh, there's an opportunity to uh, to create something much like the Civic Center was created uh, a number of years ago. Uh, this is an opportunity to uh, to revision and revitalize that space. Uh, with the, the confidence of the citizens of the city of Brantford. And I think the citizens are showing that uh, that's something that they believe in. And uh, and let's uh, take advantage of the opportunity that's presented for us uh, right now. So I, um, and certainly, uh, yeah, look forward to questions uh, and comments as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prang. Any questions for Mr. Prang? Uh, Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Prang. You, you mentioned economic development several times. You see this as something that will encourage economic development and growth within the lower downtown and even the upper downtown. Uh, do you see that as driving assessment higher to help uh, increase taxes to, to help pay for this project? Absolutely. I certainly, um, you know, it's a bit of a uh, bit of a challenge uh, from a business perspective that uh, businesses, much like residents, uh, don't want to pay more taxes, but. Uh, if there's more people and more activity uh, in an area that uh, that will drive uh, assessment growth, uh, I think this is an opportunity where you know there's there's ancillary services around ancillary services and uh, and products and businesses that would go to support uh, you know with I mean some of it's going to come anyway with residential development to the need for uh, for services for residents that are going to be living uh, in the area, both the lower downtown and the upper downtown, uh, but with a sports and entertainment complex that has uh, shoulder services. Uh, like restaurants. And I mean, if you try to get a reservation at a downtown restaurant prior to an event at the Sanderson Center or, or Bulldogs game or, or try to find uh, parking as well, you know, those are, are challenges that uh, businesses can respond to. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, spreading the the uh, cost of, of taxes and development across uh, more businesses and more 
um, more buildings uh, is better than uh, than the challenge of trying to develop, uh, you know, trying to develop on our greenfield spaces as well. Wonderful. Thank you for your comments. Any questions for Brian? Yes, Councilor Carpenter. Just one. Uh, thanks, David, for coming. Uh, you, you commented about condominium development. Are you talking about the condominium development that's already planned for all the development around the Civic Center property, or are you were suggesting that with this uh, new arena in that location, it would come later? Uh, my understanding is there's, and I, I don't want to uh, put a number out there that that's incorrect because I don't have the, the figures in front of me. But my understanding is there's the uh, you know several uh, you know to the magnitude of several hundred units that are pre-approved or in the pipeline to be approved at least residential and housing units uh, in the lower downtown area. Uh, I think, you know, the the attractiveness of being able to, uh, and, and, and you can see it in, in other centers such as Hamilton, where uh, there's, you know, higher density uh, housing units being created around what is their their current sports center in Hammer District. I think that has the opportunity to, to uh, yeah, create so the same sort of energy the, environment. That's coming yeah. regardless of what, what happens with the arena. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, thanks very much, Mr. Prang. Thank you. So we'll now move to the uh, third delegate, which again, someone coming in virtually, Barbara Sutherland from the downtown Bradford Business Improvement Area. Good evening, uh, Barbara. Uh, you know the rules, you've attended here to speak to us before. So if you please introduce yourself and then you have 10 minutes inclusive of questions. Just have to unmute yourself, please, Barbara. Barbara, we still need to unmute. You might have to select a different microphone on your settings. I'll tell you what, uh, Barbara, why don't you try and uh, figure that out and we'll move on to our fourth delegate and uh, we'll come back to you and hopefully we can work that technical bug out for you. So I'll call up Mr. Harding from the Brant Sports Council, Brant Ford Sports Council, I should say. Good evening. Uh, introduce myself, Bill Harding. I'm the chair of the Brantford Sports Council and the uh, director of the Community Sports Councils of Ontario. And uh, I was expecting more of my delegation tonight, but uh, the weather is a little, little uh, tet treacherous for them. Uh, but Chris uh, Cardick is here with us uh, this evening. He's our community engagement uh, director that looks after most of our community engagement uh, uh, activities taking place in the community. Um, I just wanted to thank you for allowing us to be here again tonight. The um, So on behalf of our executive team, um, we're looking forward to following up on the updates on the uh, entertainment complex. And I know there's been a lot of activity taking place. The Sports Council is just a collaboration of the sports organizations, community partners that work cooperatively in developing education and promotion of sport and related activity. Uh, uh, now, Bradford, as everyone knows, has a rich history in sport in sports related activity, tournaments, events and hosting, not only in the facilities we're talking about tonight, but across the board in all the sports sports fields uh, with numerous tournaments that take place throughout the year. The um, new sports and entertainment complex, in addition to other associated activity, will represent from our perspective a key element in our community sport and recreation initiatives in the community. Uh, the new updated infrastructure being proposed allows us to continue to promote and expand on sports tourism and the resulting economic impact and related activity. Um, the infrastructure, uh, we need to build on the momentum that has been established with the Bulldogs. I think uh, I'm a season ticket holder, as most of you are, and I, I, that's a first, and I'm a resident of Bradford lifetime, and since 1972 or three, 
when we had the Man Cup. I haven't seen that kind of support across the board from community. We need to build on that momentum and carry that forward into the future, not just this year, next year, but for the next 10 or 15 years as we develop our total infrastructure for our community. Sport and sport development and what you're doing here are just one element of that infrastructure. There's a number of other considerations a community makes in doing that. I know Richard talked about the development of the other properties adjacent. We need to continue to do that. We need to expand it past the budget of four years, uh, but into that 10, 15, and 20 year horizon, uh, which is always a challenge. You guys won't be here in three, four years. Most of you may, may some of you may, and some of you may not. Um, and I, I can honestly tell you that was mentioned earlier about the Civic Center. The Civic Center has been a gem for this community for a number of years. The upgrades that have taken place make that a very valuable asset in our development of community initiatives and community engagements. There's a number of things that can be hosted there that we wouldn't have had the opportunity if that was not done. So the new facility, I think a lot of people are thinking that, oh, where, what's happening with the Civic Center? The Civic Center is remaining. It's updated. It's available to do all those community engagement things that we probably couldn't get there. It's got air conditioning. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, uh, for that. So that that's very important uh, as well. So that facility is available. So we continue to focus on promoting and establishing events and support developments and hosting new initiatives. Branford hosts a number of legacy tournaments already. Uh, Branford is recognized uh, uh, outside of town as a tournament capital of Ontario. It's a destination place. Uh, having Walter Gretzky name associated with that certainly helps, but certainly it, it has been. We are a destination place. We're not just a hockey town. We have a lot of facility tournaments that take place uh, that are annual, but we're looking at new and new developments throughout the community to enhance what we do and make Banff, Branford a better place to live, work, and play, as Walter would always say. But truly to showcase Branford as a tournament capital and a center of sports excellence. Our focus to continue in the future for the next 10, 15, and 20 years, as I said. Uh, sports remains a key element. My fingers move quicker here. Sports remains a key element in the social fabric of a community and a catalyst that brings a community together. So let's keep an eye on that future. The At the end of the day, I always say it's all about the kids uh, or the young athletes or the young youth, but uh, community participation. Hang on here. So kudos to all those who give their time in sport and recreation. Uh, volunteers remain the backbone of most communities, particularly ours. So we need to ensure that we have that availability to do that. The one, one last point is that we work a lot with uh, different, uh, across, the, across the province with the community sports councils, with a lot of different industries and, and community partners. One of the key questions business ha ask when they come to a community is fees and transfers and taxes and, and process and initiatives that you can provide them with or incentives. But one of the key things, it's at the top of most of the list, what activity is available for my employees? And it's always sports. We're doing that a lot now with not just for sport groups, but for the not-for-profit groups that run sporting events. Everyone is engaged in sport at some point in our community, whether it's a volunteer, a grandfather attending a game, uh, someone, you know, just getting the juice for the kids uh, on the bench. Uh, so it, it, sport is a catalyst that brings everybody together. Uh, the Sports Council looks forward to the future development engagements with the, with the community and our community partners, but in particular the city. As most of you are aware, we've had a longstanding relationship with the city. We work on a number of initiatives uh, to help support what the requirements are from the user perspective, but also uh, dealing with what the city requires. Uh, and I, we've talked a lot about, it's not, it's not a marathon, it's, it's a marathon, not a race, uh, so uh, not a dash. So you have to keep your focus on where we are and keep moving forward. Uh, so we support, uh, continue to look to support all the initiatives of city council. Uh, we may not agree on everything all the time, but at least we have a good idea of what the requirements are and we can help be the focal point to move those things forward. And we really like the what's happening 
with the sports entertainment complex and uh, the rationales that have been provided to date. Thank you. So, thank you, Mr. Harding. Any questions uh, for Mr. Harding? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Harding, for coming out tonight. So we'll try again to bring in Barbara Th Sutherland, chair of the downtown BIA. Uh, Barbara, looks like we are, we're not hearing you. So, uh, thanks for making the effort for uh, coming out virtually tonight, uh, Barbara. Um, once again, have a pleasant evening. Thumbs up or down on the project. Yeah. All right, so that uh, concludes the delegation section, and we have two presentations on tonight's agenda. So, I'll ask the first presenter. Maria Vizaki, who is the Director of Communications, Community Engagement, Customer Service with the City. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, I am Maria Vizaki, the City's Director of Communications, Community Engagement, and Customer Service. And it's my privilege to be here tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to provide members of Council, as well as those in the Chamber and those watching, um, a summary of the findings of the first outreach engagement campaign regarding the proposed sports entertainment center. So first, just a bit of a background on what the campaign consisted of. Um, we implemented a public engagement campaign throughout the month of December. Um, it began on December 1st and it ran until January 5th. Um, and it was with respect to uh, the proposal that is being discussed tonight for a new sports and entertainment venue at 79 Market Street. We also held a public meeting on December 18th on site at the Civic Center, and we uh, ran a Let's Talk Brantford campaign on the city's Let's Talk Brantford engagement portal, um, same dates, December 1 to Jan 5th. And uh, we also ran a social media campaign throughout the same time period reaching 56,000 followers across all of the city's various social media platforms. So just a little bit about the survey demographics. Uh, 575 people completed the survey online, 91% identified as residents of Brantford. Um, this is a key point that, that I wanna highlight uh, for, for everyone watching. The age distribution on this particular survey participation uh, was different than others that the city typically sees. Uh, typically we see most of the, the participants who engage falling within the demographic of 45, 46 years of age plus, whereas with this particular survey, we saw a very balanced age distribution um, indicating that there was interest in this particular initiative from a younger demographic. Um, and again, not typical for most of the uh, projects that we engage on. So uh, I'm just gonna go quickly through some of the highlights. Um, we asked what, what the impact on Brantford's local economy would be. 80.7% of participants said it would be positive. 8.1% said it would be negative, 3.3% uh, said there would be no impact, and 7.9% of participants said that they were unsure. So uh, based on those numbers, there was overwhelmingly positive sentiments uh, suggesting endorsement from those that participated in the survey. We asked uh, participants to rank their entertainment and activity preferences. And uh, the first uh, choice was live entertainment, concerts and shows, followed closely by community sports activities, then professional sports events, dining and restaurant options, uh, retail spaces, and then closing out with hotel accommodations. 
Uh, we also asked participants to rank venue amenities. Uh, parking facilities ranked number one, followed by state-of-the-art sound and lighting systems, uh, suggesting that uh, we need a venue that has more modern technology uh, that could accommodate concerts and shows, flexible seating arrangements, uh, green spaces or outdoor areas, and then finally accessibility features. Uh, we did hold a public meeting on December 18th in the Rinkside Lounge on site at the Civic Centre. It was an evening uh, not unlike tonight. It was a bit snowy and rainy and cold, uh, but still over 100 people uh, were in attendance. And, and there were uh, mixed sentiments from those in attendance. Uh, some people fully supported the uh, initiative um, and, and gave us comments, not unlike some of the comments we heard from the delegations tonight, um, but there were others present that questioned uh, how the city would pay for the uh, project, as well as um, if it fell within what the city's priorities should be. Um, so those topics uh, definitely were raised at that meeting. Um, and we also saw some of that on social media, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, there were also questions raised about the facility's estimated annual operating costs and whether or not it would be profitable, um, and questions about what the Bulldogs' longer-term plans would be. Um, and again, there were uh, many people there that expressed enthusiasm for the project. So a, a little bit about the social media feedback. Um, so we, we ran posts throughout the month of December and the first week of January. Uh, we got over uh, 400 comments total from people who engaged on social media. 370 of those were on Facebook alone, on the city's Facebook page. And the, uh, the most um, chatted about topics were, uh, there was a lot of support and, and excitement for the new facility. And, and just um, uh, anecdotally, I can say that uh, most comments on the city's Facebook page about projects are not positive. <laughs> Um, that, that won't surprise many folks. Uh, it's, it's typical and sort of in the nature of folks who disagree with something to go to the effort to make a comment about it, where those who support it uh, remain a little bit complacent about it. They don't really take the time to go in and, and uh, comment on it. Uh, whereas with this, we saw a lot of excitement and enthusiasm in the comments section. So um, there, there were the topics like at this uh, that were similar to the ones that were raised at the public meeting, uh, where people questioned whether or not this should be a top priority of investment, considering the uh, the need for a new hospital and affordable housing. Um, but uh, you know, as if if council was following the. Uh, conversations that communication staff were having with people who raised those issues, we did try our best to correct misinformation about jurisdiction um, and uh, oversight of the hospital build. Um, so uh, another th uh, thing I wanted to share was uh, of those that engaged using the icons. So the icons are the thumbs up and the smiley face and the sad face and the angry face. Um, almost 85% of those were uh, positive, while 15.3% of those were negative. So just to close with some key observations. Um, live entertainment and professional sports events were uh, highlighted as the most popular popular uses for the venue based on those who participated in the survey. There was significant interest in events celebrating community diversity. Um, that's something we saw in the open-ended question of the survey that came up um, again and again. Uh, parking and a modern sound and lighting system were the most preferred amenities. And overall, there was broad community support for this initiative um, with an emphasis on the positive economic impact it could have on the downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Any questions for Maria? Seeing none, thank you very much, Maria. So we have a second presentation, uh, Ron, but 
Paduka, Managing Partner, KKR Advisors, LTD. Ron, it's now your welcome this evening, and uh, you now have 10 minutes, includes some questions. Thank you, Your Worship, members of council, ladies and gentlemen. It is, a, again, a pleasure to be uh, here in Brantford this evening. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, to talk about our third report, as you will recall, um, our first report, phase one report, was the business case assessment of the SEC, Sports Entertainment Center. The second report was a location assessment, and this document, the phase three, is the partnership and financing assessment. Um, in the report, we highlight 30 of the 33 buildings that have been built in Ontario since 1990. We highlight how 31 of them were financed. We know exactly how those were done. We also outline two new facilities, one in Ottawa and one in Hamilton, that are currently undergoing development. We highlight how those were financed. And then in addition to that, in terms of rounding out how other municipalities have approached the financing of community infrastructure, we highlight three more facilities, one in Aurelia, one in Guelph, and one in North Vancouver, British Columbia. And as I go through and look at all of those 33 projects, 35 projects, 36 projects, six things strike me as key observations um, from that environmental scan. Firstly, that most of the facilities, 22 of 31 that are built, were financed publicly. Most of those were financed exclusively by the municipality. In seven instances, they got federal and or provincial money. Unfortunately, the ones that got federal money were done under things like the gas tax, which is now known as the Canada Community Benefit. That has specifically outlined in it an, a line item that allows for sport, recreation, and tourism projects. Unfortunately, the federal government does not allow the financing or the, the funding of sports facilities whose lead tenant will be a professional hockey team. And the federal government assumes that an Ontario Hockey League team is a professional team. And we've tried that in a number of instances across the country to no avail of getting federal money. The other the cases, there's a little bit of provincial money. Most of that was available in either New Brunswick or Quebec. So understanding that generally a big chunk of the change to pay for these things is municipally funded. In Ontario, second point, there's a few buildings that have been able to get some level of private money, million and a half to two and a half million dollars. These were done through the early stage P3 projects. Um, and the amount of money that was provided on that was really based on what the private sector partners expected return would be in order to be able to provide that money. Where we have seen in the third point, more complex arrangements have come in, come in and these are in places like Kelowna, in Chilliwack, in Gatineau. Um, what we've seen happen here is that the municipality has been able to attract a higher percentage of that capital cost. In, in Chilliwack's case, 100% of it was fi privately financed. In, in Kelowna, BC's, it was 77%. In those instances, what the municipality did is effectively said, what we'll do is we'll provide a guaranteed revenue stream. So we'll purchase 1,500 hours of ice time in Kelowna, 7,700 hours of ice time per year in Gatineau. And what that does is gives an income stream, which the private partner can then pledge to get debt. So that's how those, that was another interesting thing. To a point that was raised earlier, we have seen in some instance, the professional sport team make a contribution into the building. Um, in, La, in Laval, um, the, 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 the team there is the AHL affiliate of the Montreal Canadiens. Um, the building is managed by Eventco, also affiliated with the Montreal Canadiens. They provided $12 million. In Chilliwack, the team, Chiefs, the team's ownership, Chiefs Development Group, they paid 100% of that cost of that building. In Hamilton, Mr. Andlauer, when he was with the Hamilton Bulldogs, he proposed to provide $30 million to finance a new building built at Lime Ridge Mall. City ultimately said no to that. But there is a third example, and there are others. Um, uh, I guess, fifthly now, what we have seen in some of the more recent instances 
in Orillia, in Guelph, in North Vancouver, in Ottawa, and even in Hamilton, is what the city has done in order to lower what their financial commitment is, that they have vended in land assets that the city owns and controls, and utilize the proceeds from A, the sale, B, uh, from the development fees that it would generate, and then C, the property taxes that those new developments would give rise to, pledging that to be able to support debt. Ottawa is doing it currently with the redevelopment at Lansdowne Park and building a new 5,500-seat arena. In Hamilton, they thought they could just pledge their three entertainment assets, First Ontario Centre, First Ontario Theatre, um, and, the, and, and the convention center. That deal ultimately evolved with three land assets, two parking lots and an office, a small office building on a municipal lot, all about half a kilometer from the existing First Ontario Center, pledged to the developer who is going to invest $500 million developing those. And then the final element that strikes us is, as a key observation from these 30 odd facilities we looked at, is that those arrangements were done both through public proposal call processes and also through unsolicited processes. So developers came to it. In Ottawa, they got two competing bids and then the, another one now from the, 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 the sports teams that own and operate that facility coming in and providing unsolicited proposals to invest money in, into those facilities. Next slide, please. So as I look at all of those facilities, and as I think about Brantford, and as I think about, uh, Maria, next slide. And as we think about what I found, what we found when we did the phase one review and look at downtown and the development that's happening and the population growth that has happened and is expected to happen and the jobs and the income. And I couple that with, you know, all of the deal experience that I've had over the last 20 or 25 years on these types of transactions. What we've done then is come up with a financing plan, a financing strategy, which is based on a number of factors. First, it's going out to the marketplace to solicit business partnerships. That means going out and securing a, a long-term commitment from the Bulldogs or another sport team tenant. It means going out and soliciting investment and or development partnership proposals from individuals and entities wanting to financially participate with the city in the development of the, of, of the arena or in the acquisition of land that the city could offer up as part of this. And thirdly, it talks about going out and seeking an entity to prepay the naming rights. Bell prepaid $20 million to find that went into the financing of Place Bell and Laval. Quebec Or invested 30 odd million dollars into the Videotron Center in Quebec City. There are lots of examples in, in and Maple Leaf Sports in Ontario, Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment guaranteed $10 million prepaid up front naming rights for BMO Field. There's lots of examples. So that's one source, that one pool of money that can be used to help pay for the building. As I alluded to earlier, there is a land sales box where the city identifies specific properties and facilities that it could vend into a transaction to help entice and make a deal more profitable for a developer investor and therefore more profitable for the city of Brantford and reduce that cost. The, the, the proceeds from that transaction, the uh, development fees that are generated from that can help support and pay for part of the building. The property taxes that those projects are that uh, generate can help support any tax-related debt that the city may issue. That's exactly the process that Ottawa is doing with the redevelopment or the, 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 the Lansdowne 2.0, as they're calling it. The third option is to do what's known as tax increment financing or revenue increment financing. And this is looking at the lower downtown or, or more broadly the downtown of Brantford and saying property taxes or, or assessed value over a certain threshold and call it 2026 and say it's a million. And if that million goes to 1.2 million or 1.5 million, a portion of that increment, so say it's a half a million dollar increment, a portion of that 
can then be captured to be able to support uh, some debt. Ottawa is doing that. Hamilton is looking to do that. Um, Guelph is looking to do that. Other municipalities are looking to do that. In much the same line, you can look at the incremental revenue that is generated by Elements Casino Brantford and going into that and saying over a baseline, again, a million dollars, if it goes from a million dollars to 1.1 million, that $100,000 of betterment, a portion of that 100,000 could be applied to support some tax supported debt. I'm not advocating that you would want to allocate 100% of that betterment because that normally would go into the general revenues to help reduce whatever uh, tax uh, levies that would be done. I am saying that what you can do is look at a portion of that amount. Ron, if you could just hold it there, we've hit 10 minutes. Um, okay. Does anybody want to make a motion to extend? Uh, moved by Councillor Sullivan. What's your motion? How long do you want to extend? Other 10, so it's a motion to extend by 10 minutes, seconded by Councillor Schloss. Any discussion? Right, call the vote, Mr. Clerk. Motion to waive the rules to allow the presentation extra time carries unanimously on a recorded vote of 10 to 0. Members of council vote in favor are as follows. Councillors Sokoli, Solvin, Caputo, Slas, Smart, McCreary, Carpenter, Samuel, Van Toborg, and Mayor Davis. All right, Ron, so you have another 10 minutes. Oh, thank you. Um, the other, another option, uh, another source of revenue to help support the financing of the event center is through fundraising and that's going corporately out to entities like Great Canadian, OLG and other Brantford based businesses, but it's also implementing a more philanthropic or grassroots um, campaign to solicit, um, you know, friends, sponsors, um, platinum sponsors, you know, selling bricks, et cetera, into the venue in order to make and generate some proceeds. Um, that was done very successfully in a place like Moncton that got $2.5 million from its downtown BIA. And then the final number is once you get the, the cost of the building and subtract the, the revenue that you generate from the partnerships and the tax increment and the land sales and the fundraising, that's the city of Brantford's obligation. And that can be done through both reserves and through tax supported debt. And this is my last slide. And then this is the implementation plan. Why isn't it going? I'll walk through it. So the implementation plan is really looking at starting, it's premised on firstly, the city going out and saying that this is a priority project and we would like, and we want to move forward with it. And declaring it a priority project gives certainty to the market as you then proceed to go out on a request for business partnerships process that the city is in fact committed to this. So as you are going through that, what you will also do is do preparatory site due diligence. And what I mean by this is that there is a lot of what of, there's a lot we don't know about the Civic Center site. From an archeological perspective, from a geotechnical perspective, from a hydro G perspective, from a transit, from a, tra from a traffic perspective, you are doing that research to help inform a, a developer who may want to come in and not have to then do that work later and B, help to inform the design process that will follow. And we're saying that that will be done concurrently with the request for business partnerships. That will take about 13, 14 months, in my opinion. I think you can get the business, process, business partnership process done by third, fourth quarter this year, following which you can then start on design, then move into construction tendering and ultimately construction and that process could potentially be shortened through kind of a construction management type um, process. We outline in the report and, 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 and through that process, it's open in September of 2027. You could potentially advance that. So the building opens September 2026. That, however, requires 
that I think it's not the prudent way to do it because it would require you to front end design and pay for design and take the process and financial risk associated with front fronting that design. And quite frankly, as I said, I don't think that's a prudent course. I think you, because what you could ultimately do is get through a design, spend a lot of money on design and have the business partnership rip that up and crunch it up and throw it out because you can't get it done on the design to where it is. That's my presentation and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you have. Councillor Schloss. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work to do when you're talking about going out, lining up partnerships, going out, soliciting money, going out and doing all of these things. Who does that? Is that you? So yes, it is me. Um, going out and soliciting the business partnerships is something I've done multiple times. And I do mean like multiple greater than 10 times in my career. Um, there are other post pieces that need to be done. Um, archaeologically reviewing the site to making sure that, that there's no issues and same thing with geotech, et cetera. Fundraising I don't do, but I can go out and secure the, the corporate sponsorships for this a building like this. Knowing the situation here and knowing your background and the number of times that you've gone through this process personally, do you see a positive outcome in you going out and finding people in the marketplace that will work with the city? I do. In fact, we've already had expressions of interest. Sorry? We've already had unsolicited expressions of interest. Parties informing me that they would like to be involved in this project. It's probably not something you want to discuss publicly. Not yet. And I think I understand that. Thank you. Councilor McCurry. Amir, thank you. Um, Ron, could you explain, go into a bit of detail about the decision-making process going forward? There'll be a number of times when this council meets again uh, throughout the life of this project. Correct. Um, so if, if council elects tonight to move forward, that is not the last time you get a say in this project. You get a say in a few weeks as you look at potential sites to include within the RFPP process. You... We, we are back in front of you in May, where we start, we present to you some of the deals that we've gotten in place. We want direction from you on that. In October, September, we're back to you with approval for the deals that we've negotiated. Short, around that time, we're, we're with you as you start to now, as, as a pure financing plan is, is, is evolved to approve what that is. You will then be approving a design. You will then be approving um, the, the final construction costs for those projects. There are six, eight process steps, a lot of them happening in the next nine or 12 months for you to then look at this and, and, and dictate to make sure that where we, where we have proceeded from and where we're going to meets with your, what your expectations are. Thank you for that. Councilor Carpenter. Thank you. You've kind of eased my mind on how you laid this out. Uh, and I agree with you, rushing it's not a good idea. Going the long route to, to take the risk, as much risk away from the municipality as possible, I, I agree with. Um, the $30 million you talked about, uh, the Bulldogs were willing to put into a center, uh, that would be an option. That may be an option still for us here. Correct. And we would we would know all these things well in advance before we locked ourselves into building something, we'd have all these things, all these pieces in place is what you've been telling, what I'm hearing you say here. Correct. So I would know, the community would know then what what level of risk we were at and what our, what our costs were going to be. Correct. I appreciate that. And uh, the tax incremental financing, <clears throat> uh, that would, uh, you, you, you recommend keeping a por portion of that because we use that for to reduce the tax mill, the mill rate uh, by increased assessment, but and we have used it, that in areas before, you know, incremental pay for industrial parks, for example. Uh, so, and a lot of municipalities have done that. The fundraising, uh, I'm not real keen on, but fundraising is a difficult process to do when, we're, when we would be fundraising for a new hospital at the same time. Uh, and the community is only so big to be able to take that. So uh, the, the community partnerships is really the key, isn't it? I, I think it's all of those elements oh, rolled the, into one. Some of them, and again, in some cases, 
the fundraising corporately, spinning that into building sponsorships that are being prepaid and having them coming in as the official supplier or the, you know, or, or, or even like all of those elements come out of that fundraising element. Oh, I see. I see. As opposed to the, the typical fundraising we are used to. That's correct. Different. Thank you for that. And the, uh, the, the vended land assets, I'm curious about that. So they would be land assets throughout the city, not necessarily land assets like the Earl Hague, for example, or the land beside. They could be whatever land assets that the city has identified um, could be vended in. So for example, I know one of the sites that we looked at at Eagle and Erie, I think there's a Petro Canada station in and around there. That one has, I think, a little bit of value um, that could be um, have a much higher and better use than it is currently, which is just grass. Oh, I see. And some of the so when some of the other vended land assets would be land assets that the city owns. Correct. And it could be it could be like Spurnberg Farm land that we own on Parland Road could be a, an asset. And, and then did you talk about also providing the, the the tax revenue from that asset going back in as part of repayment? That is an option that would be available. Yes, that's another option. So, so increase taxes that we wouldn't have otherwise had being returned. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Ron, we're almost up to another ten minutes, but uh, I've got a question about the decision making process. So, mm -hmm. when is what stage is the point of no return? Is that the very last decision to construct, or it could be depending on what? What we're encountering, it could be any one of those go points if we run into insurmountable problems. Well, in theory, it could be any one of them. If yeah. if there's insurmountable problems that you have to, you know, put pilings down five yeah. miles into the site, you wouldn't want to do that. It'd be eminently expensive. But the point of no return would be if you went out for construction tenders and those construction tenders came in at X and you said, we can't go there. So all of the investment to that point would be lost, but you wouldn't be paying the full amount of the building going right. forward. Okay, so we've gone beyond the additional 10 minutes. Um, I think everybody's probably asked their questions. Thanks very much, Ron, that was very um, informative. So we have uh, no, uh, well, first of all, so we have uh, no items for consideration. We do have one urgent report for consideration. If I can get a mover, Councillor McCreary, and a seconder, Councillor Sluss, uh, to put the Sports Entertainment Center Community Feedback Phase 3 update on the floor for discussion. Who wants to go first? Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think this is a, an exciting project that we need to progress on. Um, what we've heard tonight, I think, is all good news that the, there's lots of potential for this. The the idea that there are various stages where we can say no if, if we run into problems, I think, is, is good for this council that, that uh, we can pull the plug at, at several different points. But I see this as, as going for the long haul. I think any money that's mm -hmm. invested in the steps leading up to it will lead to <clears throat> sorry a good project that we will want to go forward with i think the economic development potential for Brantford will be wonderful it'll help drive uh development uh in the lower lower downtown and, and the upper downtown as well so i see this as as increasing assessment that'll help pay for whatever debenture amount that we end up borrowing to, to build this facility it's going to be a great booster for the morale of Brantford. And we've, anybody who's been to a Bulldogs game has seen the excitement in the arena. And that place gets packed and it gets loud. And that's wonderful for, for the, and right in today's paper, the owner of the team acknowledged that the team appreciates the energy level in that building and that gives them a home field advantage. And I think that speaks volumes to the support that Brantford has for this team. And we'll have for the sports center and for the team staying here, hopefully for the long haul. So I'll be supporting this tonight. Thank you. Councillor Samuel. 
Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I have a few questions. I too also think that it's an exciting opportunity and love the, cam the camaraderie that I see at the Bulldogs games. But I do want to know um, if we are to prioritize the, uh, this project, what will that mean to our other council priorities? And also if you could comment on the hospital and housing and homelessness as well. Uh, you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Samuel, Brian Hutchings, City CEO, um, speak to the first one, the priorities. When we did the priorities in January 2023, um, this obviously was, wasn't was on the horizon. Uh, came forth on February 7th. And so we have 10 priorities of council. This will be a number 11. It'll, it'll allow me to sort of a priority and also allow me to report back to council on this. So this will include that and, and allow me to spend efforts on that myself as well as allocate staff resources to that. Um, on the on the housing and and uh, uh, and, and and hospital side, uh, I have a slide. If 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 council will indulge me, or I can answer it verbally, or I can use the slide for the public's reference. It's up. To, I'll turn it to you, Mr. Chair. What you would like me to do? Yeah, let's. If you could provide provide us with the slide, I think that might be helpful. Okay, Stephen, if you could put up the slide, please. That shows very well. Maybe make it full picture. So if if you look at the hospital estimated costs. Um, about what's two billion dollars. Um, if you look at uh, the local contribution, would be about ten percent of that, which is about two hundred million. And I, you know, and I come, I have, I've been a board chair of a hospital and involved in the hospital system for uh, many years ago. Most of the standard is twenty five percent is trying to raise by local donors. So I'm guesstimating fifty million dollars. The hospital has not made that announcement. I'm just guesstimating here. So it's about one hundred fifty million dollars that the municipalities will have to raise. On a population basis, with the county being one third of the city, they'll have to come up with 50 million and the city have to come up with 100 million. Thus to date, in the last two years, the city has put aside 8.5 million, an average of 4.25 million per year. If you factor that out over eight years, with the hospitals building eight years, if we keep continuing this trend with monies we're, we're putting aside, it's about another 34 million. And uh, in, in eight years, the city should have about $42 million sitting in a bank account waiting to contribute to that with the remaining 57.5 million. If you know anything about uh, municipal financing, you usually finance things for the future generations. And that's quite standard to have about 50% set aside and the other 50% to finance. And this doesn't include, I think maybe it's, uh, it doesn't include the fire hall and the parking lot that we don't donate it to the, uh, to the hospital, which will be put at value to uh, eight years hence. That'll also go in this, this amount as well. So that's the hospital side. On the housing side, if I can have Stephen click a couple times. One more time, Stephen, on the next slide, please. Uh, so the housing plan is 2020, 20, 20, 20, 30. It's 843 units. We're four years in. I, I would guess actually three and a half years. So I'd say 35%. I use 40% here. We have 43% completed or in progress on all our targets. Uh, the city has knocked it out of the park compared to any other city. We talked with the Social Service Committee back in December. And we've also even, next next uh, click, Stephen. Uh, if um, we have a financing strategy for the not-for-profit sector, the first will be on 32 Bridge Street. The JCs will do another 24 units. And in addition to that, next slide, uh, we've seen our wait list in just this year alone go from 1,214 households to 1,030, almost a drop of 20% in 12 months. So we've been tackling this, uh, Councillor Samwell. Uh, we have uh, the other side. I've got three uh, capital or four capital issues to deal with: our everyday roads and sewers and things like that. Council has looked at those. We see it's we're investing in all those matters. It's probably the highest amount of capital budget we've seen the last years, and our finance team has figured out a way to finance that. So between our regular capital plan, our, our uh, hospital plan, our housing plan, and now this. Uh, we've been able to balance all these things out under good management and good uh, leadership from our finance team. Councilor Samuel, do you want me to put down for a second opportunity? Okay. Any any other discussion? Councilor Sluss. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I think as a city, we have to get out of the 80s mindset that uh, some folks are just stuck in. Um, I think we have to embrace and we have to celebrate the city we are today. And it doesn't remotely resemble where we came from. Um, we've emerged as a strong, vibrant city and we continue to emerge and we're growing very quickly. I think if I recall from the consultant, one of his reports, 
we had the fastest growing income. You, you can maybe clarify that for me. We, we have the highest mean income in the province. W was that the numbers you used? No, between 2020 or 2000 and 2020, Brantford had was the, the, the high, had the highest percentage growth in income and the highest total dollar value growth in income, more than any other CMA with an OHL team in Ontario. I appreciate that. Thank you. It's something that we beat ourselves up for all the time, and I don't think we take credit when credit's deserved. I take comfort in knowing that we have a top-notch consultant leading this project. Uh, this isn't your first rodeo. You've been down this road many, 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 many times. You can tell by your presentation, you know from where you speak, and you instill confidence, at least in me, and I presume in others. We have the, the Brantford Bulldogs is a first-class operation. I don't think there's any that would rival it in the OHL, from my perspective. Um, they're well-financed, they're well-managed, they're well-run. It's, it's a, a stellar organization. We couldn't ask for a more concrete anchor tenant in a new facility. It's not some fly-by-night thing that we hope somehow works out and we're, we're going on a wing and a prayer. We're going on a known quantity and a well-respected and a well-financed quantity. So I, all of those things considered, uh, I don't know how one could not support going further. Uh, there are several checkpoints. There are several decision uh, opportunities as we move forward. And the, the, I think the further down the road we get, the finer point we'll get on this and we'll know exactly where we're heading. And at that time we can make those decisions. So I'm pleased to support this tonight. And I think the, uh, the community will be better for it. Thank you. Any other discussion? Before I go to the second speakers, Councillor Carpenter. Thank you. Uh, to our CAO, then, our costs here tonight that we're approving is $735,000? Yes, Councillor. And is that coming from capital reserves? Yes, Councillor. And uh, the, so to date, other than what we put into the Civic Center for the Bulldogs contract, uh, that means our total is, is $935,000 spent in this investigative process to find out whether we can financially do this or not? Yes, from the motion of February 28th. Yeah. We were directed to uh, bring you up to this point. We've delivered on that. There's one outstanding matter, it's phase four, which Ron's delivering today, actually. Um, and that was $200,000. So, yes, it would be uh, another 735000 to do the work and also the, the pre-work on the property and what have you. And when it talks about uh, in the resolution making this um, a priority project, this is a priority project, not the priority project. Exactly. Because it's adding to the list of priority projects. So it's not saying, we're not saying, this has got a priority over the hospital. It's what, it's well, I just want to be clear. The city is, you're, if you're talking, the city's not responsible. I know a lot of people on Facebook think the city's building the hospital. The city's not no. responsible for building the hospital, but the city was responsible for possibly funding, you know, the $100 million towards that. So, yeah. um, the hospital could do a lot to educate the public on exactly what the plans are and what the needs are. Uh, and and the, that's the concern I have with the community. Uh, that, that the community has concern about our hospital. Our hospital, we know, is on life support, literally. And uh, we need we need a hospital 10 years ago. And eight years from now is even a concern. So a hospital, that this won't affect the hospital. I think this is what we need to be clear about that. So the, the financing coming forward, I'd like to say the hospital do more to come to the community and come to council and tell us what they're doing and how they can do it, how, how we can be of assistance a little clearer for the community. For me, my liking as well. So, the, you know, no one uh, it can say that uh, as a bigger fan than the Bulldogs than I am. I, 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 that's my thing, hockey. I love hockey. I love it all, all the way around. But I, I'm, I'm not going to sell the whole community for it. Uh, you know, I'm going to make sure we get a, if we get a first-class facility, that we get a facility that, that we can afford to pay for in the road, down the road. And then we have a team long-term. So, I'm, I, for me, I'm want, I want a long-term commitment from the Bulldogs. I want a long-term not not a, just a verbal commitment. I want some financial. I need some rubber to hit the road. I need some financial numbers and financial agreement between the Bulldogs 
or any OHA team for that matter, that's willing to, to be part of this arena when it's built. If that doesn't happen, you'll lose my, you won't get my support if there's not skin in the game. So, uh, so I, I, I'm willing to go forward tonight on it uh, be, and, and give you the opportunity. I do, as Councillor Celeste says, I have a lot of confidence in this and you as a consultant for what you've provided us so far and how you've laid this out and how you've given, given us the opportunities uh, for to, to create the partnerships, to look at the funding formula and how we'll pay. I, I'm not a fan of saying, oh, well, it's going to bring economic development, so therefore you got to do it and you can't measure that. We're going to get economic development regardless. It's happening anyways. So, but but having what what it will do for the city as a whole, the downtown bowl, all, all of that is, is the right thing. And I do think downtown is the right location for this as well. You wrap it up. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Van Tilburg. I uh, sometimes wonder whether I want an arena or I really want the Bulldogs. And, I, and I'm serious when I say that. I've, uh, I think we we landed a gift when the Bulldogs came here looking for a place to play. The Civic Center has benefited greatly from that. It was nice to hear a present presenter come and state uh, how valuable that investment in the Civic Center was. Uh, we wouldn't be able to get any investment in the Civic Center. There was no reason to pony up. Uh, this office gave us a wonderful opportunity to see an OHL team in play in Brantford and what the response would be. I also was told that they were going to struggle this year. Boy, I kind of like this struggle. If this is struggling, I, I kind of like it. But one of the things I do notice is that there is a significant impact in the mindset of the community from the times the Bulldogs have arrived. There is a plus. There's very much a motivated benefit happening that wasn't there before. We still have all of our warts and troubles to deal with, but this is a new entity. And when we were doing our priorities, and if you look at those priorities in the beginning of last year, homelessness, housing, uh, hospitals, you know, those are the things we're going for. This wasn't on the table, but thank goodness we didn't drop the ball or the puck, or thank goodness we did drop the puck because we've got a team playing and we and we get to, we get to see firsthand what's impact there. So one of the things that I have noticed is that there is an economic benefit to them being in the team right now, and you see it from the businesses. There are pros and cons. Believe me, if you were to answer my phone, there are cons. Having the Bulldogs here, believe me, um, comes along with parking and access and stuff. But that's, that's way better than no impact. Could you imagine if we were having no impact? So these are part of the growing pain. So now it is step-by-step step evaluating the value of, of, in my mind, having the Bulldogs stay with us. I honestly couldn't feel the same way about another team. Um, and I'm going to say it this way. I've never been to a game. I've never traveled uh, with the other counselors to another community to see their arenas. I haven't even had a chance to see the changes at the Civic Center. I work a lot. Um, but I want to. But what I do have is social media and I hear. And I hear more positives than, than I generally want to turn social media off because I'm generally hearing negatives. So this is, it enlightens my day. So really what's important now is watching the dollars and cents protecting assets that the community feels are very valuable to them and moving forward on initiatives that we have to do for the rest of the community. And so those are the things that I'll be sticking with as we move forward. And uh, I'm very impressed with how we've gotten along this far. So I'll leave it at that for now. Councilor Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we go back to when we actually hosted the Hamilton Bulldogs into this uh, chamber um I, I stated that uh we would actually hoist the championship during their stay here and i think we're well on our way to doing that it's it's part of having a top-notch organization and a group uh and how they conduct themselves business-wise and i think it's important every question i get from a lot of residents is the fact of what can we do about downtown um, i ask them questions why don't they go downtown 
And the biggest thing that I hear is that there's nothing to bring them downtown. Now, we addressed that four months ago when we brought a hockey team here, and it certainly has brought to downtown life. Um, we see it with restaurants. We see it in the people. We see it in the fans. And we see it in the city. Even for people who haven't gone there, including yourself, Councillor Van Tilburg, um, it's certainly a positive. Um, when there's discussion about skin in the game and all those other things, I'm pretty sure there's some OHL ramifications that I'm sure I don't know about. Uh, but I'm sure at some point we can get some clarity on that um, in terms of uh, verbal agreements and so forth. But um, in building a city, in building anything, you start from the inside and work your way out. And we've done a great job in working our way out. And it's now time to put ourselves back into building the inside. And when you do that, it's going to bring to city of life. Every city is trying to revitalize their downtown core. Outside of Toronto, outside of Vancouver, outside of Montreal, most cities are really destitute in what they're looking at from their downtown core. And we have an opportunity here now to do something and set ourselves up for the next 50 years, the same way the Civic Center did it 50 years ago or 65 years ago, whatever the time frame was. And I think doing this is mandatory. I think it brings together a community and it's going to bring us uh, something that we haven't had here. And as we grow in population, as we grow everywhere else, it's going to give something to a community that is dying for something like this. I've lived in six other communities in my 57 years of being alive, and every one of those communities have built a new arena, and what it did to the downtown core is absolutely fantastic. Living in London, I watched them make a decision whether they were going to go from the 403 where they were to downtown. It caused havoc, and all I know is the downtown core of London has thrived ever since that arena got built, and I see the same thing happening here. I'm in full support of this arena. I've always have been. I debated it when, when we were going through um, the election. I talked about it and actually said during the debate that I wanted to bring an OHL hockey team here and one fell in our lap. So um, I strongly urge everyone to back this. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And um, that's all I got. Thanks. Any other comments before we go to second round? Councilor McCreary. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, and I, I just want to address um, the process uh, that we've enjoyed getting here and where we're headed. Um, the mayor was instrumental in, along with our CAO in, in landing this hockey team for Brantford and uh, their leadership and, and the leadership of our consultant has gotten us to this point. Um, and our process has been clear and our process has been transparent. The Moving forward with the Arena Alliance, with an awful lot of, of, of our policies and practices, um, it, it, it satisfies our economic development strategy. It looks to our parks master plan, uh, our sports tourism strategy, and those folks are here with us tonight. The official plan, urban uh, design manual, and the downtown uh, improvement plan. So we check off a whole bunch of boxes uh, in proceeding with this. We've assessed the business case and, and we've heard the stats about Bradford being uh, now a prosperous and, and uh, progressive city uh, in, in, in many cases. Um, we have uh, looked at the location and, and you know, there's there still remains a lot of conjecture about better locations and the community should be aware that the consultant and council and staff did look at a number of locations. And for a lot of reasons, uh, it's going to be next to the Civic Center. We're in the process now of looking at partnerships and financing. And um, as has been said here a number of times tonight, it's not a matter of competing uh, for scarce dollars. We can do this and we can do the other things, too, before the decade is out. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, I'm fully supportive of this. We, we've heard from the community and I know people say that you know it's it's a limited response that we got from the community but it is the response that we got and whether it's 10 people or ten thousand people that commented uh, the, the outcome is clear that people want to see this happen um so going forward we will be employing the same sort of rational thought that has got us this far uh we will be uh touching a certain other uh, opportunities to revise rethink and abort the process. Um, we're not committing tonight 
to putting a shovel in the ground. Um, and we do have an awful lot of opportunities to re-examine this before the first puck is dropped or the first lacrosse ball goes in a net at that arena. And on that topic, um, we are underway. Councilor Carpenter, I, Councilor Samuel, the mayor, we are uh, reaching out to teams that we have now. We're going to be reaching out to other opportunities to bring major teams to this city to help fill that arena and help create the same kind of buzz summer, spring, fall and winter, uh, not just hockey opportunities. So, you know, we're, we're in a good position to go forward. We do this logically. We do it openly. And um, it's it, this will be extremely good for this uh, municipality. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, too, am in support of it at this particular time. Obviously, where this is very low risk for us to go and explore uh, what the possibilities could be, uh, what potential partnerships could be out there with this. Uh, I think we would be irresponsible if we didn't investigate this with the economic development that could come from it and the benefits to the city. Um, like I said, with the low risk we're currently at and the fact that we can drop out at any given time, I think uh, we would be foolish not to go forward. Anyone else for a speaking opportunity? Uh, before we go to second speaking opportunities, I'd like to say a few things. I don't want to repeat anything that's been said or anything I've said in the past, but a couple of different perspectives. I've I've looked at, so at this stage, we're looking at, uh, does it make sense to move on to the next stage? And uh, because there are many more stages to go through and uh, many more public discussions. And so I thought to myself, if we didn't have the Bulldogs, uh, would we be looking at doing something with the Civic Center to replace it? And I think there's a lot to be said that, yeah, that's something we would be doing anyways in the very near future, because we're dealing with a building that's 60 years old. Um, the fact that it's now being used uh, to capacity on a weekly basis, we're now beginning to see that there are some problems with the building that are basic in structure that these renovations don't address. And so, for example, in 1967, I think people then might have been fitter, maybe, and maybe a bit smaller because I'm I, I, sitting there weekly. I can barely get into the seats. They're very narrow seats. And, you know, people nowadays, so if you're a little bit burly, you really can't sit in those seats. And I've heard of many people who had to give up their season's tickets because they just, the seats are too narrow. Uh, of greater concern, though, is the fact the building is really not accessible to a great degree. Uh, there's very limited capacity for those who are wheelchair dependent. You have to reserve in advance, get an appointment. Uh, for those that are a little unsteady on their feet, and I have many friends that would fall into that category, might have a hip problem, back problem, knee problem. When you walk down into that bowl, the, the, the bowl stairways leading to the seats are so narrow that you can't put railings in there. And it really is, I've had people tell me they've gone once, they don't want to go back because they feel very uh, uncomfortable because they have certain mobility issues. Certainly a new arena would address that. You know, we know the, the washrooms don't work really well in terms of their capacity, in terms of the movement in and out of the washrooms. The concessions are barely adequate. Um, we have uh, a situation where uh, we have a building that doesn't have any corporate suites. And I've learned in the tours that we've done of other buildings, if you don't have corporate suites, you're not getting an OHL team. Like that's a basic requirement for an OHL team because it helps uh, the owner of the building, usually a municipality in terms of their revenue. It also generates additional revenue and income for the team. And oftentimes it, you know, it can make a team financially viable and a building financially viable. Um, what I also find interesting is that we don't have what the County of Brant has. The County of Brant took the Sillaps Arena, and they now have that available for indoor sports, indoor practicing uh, uh, baseball, soccer, all kinds of other activities, because they don't have ice in that facility anymore. And if we have this second ice, then we have the possibility of the Civic Center becoming uh, strictly set uh, assigned to something like basketball, lacrosse, those those dry sports that don't require ice all the way through the year. Or perhaps the Lions Park Arena can become something similar to Sill Apps, and thus providing uh, for our community 
uh, a sporting option uh, uh, that is uh, not professional, but in fact is amateur and helping amateurs in our community progress and be able to practice through winter. So there's there's a lot of reasons to consider uh, a new arena because with a six-year-old arena, you know you're going to be replacing it in 10 to 15 or 20 years. And unless you're happy with having a 1,200-seat arena as your your main arena facility. And I think I've probably hit pretty close to four minutes. I've got a few other things to say about the Bulldogs and the OHL that hasn't been spoken about, but first we'll go to Councillor Samuel. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, reading through the survey results, I noticed that there was a lot of concerns relating to Earl Hag and the green space next to it. Um, I was wondering if somebody could speak to whether the plan is still to stay in the footprint of the Civic Center and if there is any risk to Earl Hag. Councillors, I said on December 18th, the 100 people there as well, the current layout is for the uh, Civic Center property right, right adjacent to the Civic Center, and that's all we're, that's we plan. It will affect the parking. And so that was brought up as well. But it's only for the Civic Center site. Thank you. Any other second time speakers, Councilor Carpenter? Uh, on that note, though, that would be a vended asset that could be uh, part of the deal for getting funding for the new arena. Uh, certainly, someone could just, just say that would be a great spot to put three or four 20 story towers up and th that revenue would then fund the cost of the arena. So part of our vended land asset looking into, certainly all assets will be on the table, would they not? I believe that would be a discussion. We talk about land and camera, but uh, at this point in time, we haven't considered that. But we would consider all assets, would we not? We look at all city assets, yes. Okay, I just want to be clear about that. And, and uh, just, I, I want to remind members of council, though, we had an OH A team here before. The Brantford Alexanders were here, and, and when they were winning, uh, that arena was full. In fact, one of the, uh, what I call the haulers, uh, that would holler at the, during the Brantford Alex other games is still coming to the Bulldogs games. You hear him there all the time. You hear him call out usually the goalie's name out. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been to that Alexander's game, you've heard him. Yeah, he has the same guy. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, they, that, that arena was full when they were winning and it wasn't so full when they weren't winning. And uh, then eventually they moved on. So I just, you know, just because we're in a, Good stage with the Bulldogs now. You know, everybody loves to go to a game and fill the stadium when they're winning, not so much when they're yeah. losing. Because uh, I, the, the Marlies, for example, play in the AHL, and, and it's in Toronto. And I was in that stadium recently, and it was half empty. I was amazed how empty it is. I cannot believe what they're not. It's Toronto. You would think for sure be full. Uh, try and get a seat at the Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens. But, or not Maple Leaf Gardens, but Toronto Maple Leafs Gardens is gone. So, you know, it, it's all positive at the time. So we have to make sure that we have a team that's going to be here and stay here. And uh, the Bulldogs, certainly owner currently, believes in hockey and believes in winning. Uh, that's clear by the trades uh, and what he's making going forward. So, you know, when I, when I came here, I had some concern about supporting the concept that this was going to be our number one project. But that's not what this says. And with the the, the Ron Ron's uh, report, to me, gave me a lot of confidence that we can go forward at this point. I can support this now because uh, I do support the Bulldogs. I do support hockey and I do support arena. Don't forget where that arena came from, the Civic Center. It came from working people paying a dollar per paycheck out of their paychecks. We always recognize how we got that arena in the first place, hardworking people. So uh, I could I could support this going forward with the confidence knowing that we have the ability to get the funding to make it work. And that that's 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 my concern and I'll continue supporting it as long as we're not putting it on the backs of the taxpayer and then I'm, I'm okay with getting something for our community anytime. Thank you. Especially if it's positive. Councilor Schloss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It, uh, I don't want to digress back into the 80s and, and discuss what happened to a team that used to be here um, in a different era. Um, I, I don't buy that argument. I, what I do buy is the new Brantford, what I'm seeing, my, my eyes aren't lying to me. Uh, I, I don't think I've, I, yes, I've missed one game so far this year. 
Uh, so I've, I've, see, I've seen what goes on down there, and I don't think it's a case of if we're losing, we're gone. Uh, I, I think it's a rebuilding year, and, and I, that's how I would view it. And I think this team, with the ownership that it has, um, if we're concerned about losing, I, I don't think it's something that's going to happen. If they have a bad year, they'll have a bad year. But everybody can't win all the time. But I don't think a bad year is going to be the demise of uh, OHL hockey in this city this time. Any other second speakers? I'd like to um, say a few comments. Uh, some of us have visited other arenas uh, in the province. Uh, we've had tours by the arena operators. Uh, we've spoken to team owners. We've spoken to fans in other communities. And it's interesting, the last time we were in Barrie, and in Barrie, Barrie is the downside of the, it's a four-year cycle for OHL teams because the, 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 the kids cycle in and out. And they're in a down year, and the stadium was full. 5,000. And I talked to a few fans and they said, yeah, this is our building year. We're here to support them. So I think, you know, true OHL fans understand that. And then I was speaking to the owner of the, the Barry Colts and I said, what's so, what's really significant to you about this beyond uh, the arena and having an OHL team? And he said, uh, he said to me, this has replaced the farmer's market of a hundred years ago, farmer's market of a hundred years ago. That would be the gathering point every Saturday for an entire community. That would be the only place the community could shop and people would come and shop and interact with one another and talk and catch up. He said the, uh, what's happened in Barrie is that that becomes like the farmer's market of a hundred years ago. That becomes a weekly gathering place where people come in and out. And it's not always the same people because season's pass holders often pass their tickets on to other people. Uh, the other thing that was interesting in Barrie, their arena is on the outskirts of the city in that area of the south, right near the 400, lots of shopping centers. It's not in the downtown. And I had three counselors tell me the biggest mistake we made was not going downtown. Um, and they said, if we could do it again, we'd have it downtown. I said, well, why? And they said, because when it's in a shopping center area, it doesn't really add anything to the vitality of the surrounding area, which is consumed by shopping and commercial activities. And that was interesting. But compare that to the visit we had in St. Catharines, the Meridian Center, again, talking to fans, owners, operators, and counselors, and the mayor. Um, that's a facility that's right in the downtown. And speaking to the councillors in St. Catharines, they said the best decision they made was going downtown. And I said, well, why? And they said, because it's totally reinvigorated our downtown. It was a downtown that was dead before. And they said, between what Brock has been doing and the, and the Ice Dogs organization has revitalized their downtown, they said they can attribute to the land around the marina, around the arena, a fourfold increase in the value of that property for property tax purposes. And that's new buildings, buildings that have a new life. They said that's how we paid for this arena. It's the additional property tax that the, the property owners in the area around the arena are paying because the impact the arena's had on their property created new economic activity, a new vitality. And so that was that was really interesting hearing from those who uh, have arenas and the decisions they made. And I think there's also something that um, you know, there's no question the Bulldogs are are one of the best uh, and well managed teams in the OHL. Uh, many have say that they've got a terrific record. They usually get the Memorial Cup every four or five years. They're a great team to have because of the way they treat the players the commitment they have to the players and their community. And that's something you don't often hear people talk about. The Bulldogs come with a foundation. And this foundation is well endowed. It has quite a, quite a lot in terms of assets, so much so that it donates a million dollars a year to charities. Primarily it's been focused in Hamilton. The focus is now shifting to Brantford. And that's a million dollars a year. There's no other foundation, no other charity in Brantford that donates a million dollars a year. And that's primarily or orientated towards youth and youth-based charities. Uh, we're gonna see more of that uh, charitable giving of the Bulldogs Foundation, I'm quite confident of that. Um, also, when you have something like a hospital campaign, I've seen them before in other communities, 
and is having foundations like the Bulldogs that really give a campaign, a hospital fundraising, fundraising campaign a boost because they have the assets. Plus, when you build an arena, you, you, you build these partnerships with certain builders and developers. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you'll find that they will come now that they have a relationship with your city, they will come to a hospital fundraising mm -hmm. campaign in a big way. And so in some ways, having what it is that the kind of partnerships you generate for something like this can actually help you the hospital campaign. And with that, I guess I've gone beyond four minutes. So I'll go to Councillor McCurry. Uh, just, just one additional uh, comment, Mayor, and, and well said, by the way. Um, I don't think you can stress enough the importance of an opportunity like this to the city of Brantford and more notably the folks that live here. Um, I see a lot of children there with their moms and dads at this event, uh, the Bulldogs, and we'll hopefully see some of them going to major series lacrosse maybe in the next few years. Councillor Carpenter is thinking we might be able to entice a basketball team here to Brantford. And, you know, I, I look at the continuity and the ability of folks to interact with one another. We had um, a young family that sat on my left at the last game, mom and dad and a couple of young kids. And, um, we had quite a good chat and it turns out that the young lad was playing at the civic center. His dad played there and I played there when we played hockey. Uh, and they all went home with big foam hands and cowbells, which funny enough, they didn't ring much while they were in their parents' presence. Um, but you know, you, I, I don't think you can, I don't think you can um, stress enough how important it is for families in this community to interact with other families and to do it in a way that's affordable to them. Uh, you certainly couldn't take a family of four to see the Leafs. Uh, God knows why you'd want to, unless you're a fan of the visiting team. But um, it's, it's, it's so important when you see that social aspect that happens in that building and outside that building and the, the buzz that's just around the events. And I look at the, the variety of events that we'll have there. Because after all, it's a sports and entertainment complex. It's about more than just junior a hockey and um I, I i think we'll look back on this and a number of days to come as being watershed moments in this community uh and I, I think we can all um we can all look forward to the process going forward and what's going to come out the end of that is something pretty pretty wonderful for this uh, city of ours council Caputo. thank you mr mayor um when i spoke previously i kind of put it out there of OHL guidelines, rules, regulations, um, what got us the team, what's keeping them here now, and how do we go forward with them going forward? And we talk about commitments from an owner and so forth, but are there not OHL rules? And I guess a, a question's out there, and I don't know if I have to ask you, Ron, that question, if it's possible, if they'll get an answer. Um, is there um, legalities from an OHL perspective? Uh, we were granted a team for three years uh, and uh, for the time being, but we we are an OHL market, but how do we move forward with that without having a new arena in place? So if, if I can get that question answered, I, I would love it. Thanks. Well, you got me stumped. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that is an answer that can be readily found out um but you know to be to be honest the the if we can do a long-term agreement with the hockey team um and you know I, I think the owner would go to the ohl commissioner and commit to having the team permanently here i think part of the issue would also be you'd want to get a realignment done because you don't want to play in the east anymore Yeah, it would be nice to have cities that are about an hour away from us as as uh, competition and build rivalry. So, uh, thank you. Unless someone else, the answer to that, I'll do the rest. Well, I I, I might have some information, but uh, if the committee is okay, I can provide it. Uh, it's based on you know through the fall, I've had various conversations with Mr. Andalar. And I can tell you that he's like he's ecstatic about uh, very, very gratified the reception he's received in our community. He's, he said that in the Spectator article. Um, 
he said to me that um, the the way this community has reacted has exceeded all of their expectations. They uh, it's something that they didn't really expect to this degree, and so they're very happy. But um, I asked him that question. I didn't realize this, uh, but. Uh, the OHL is uh, these kinds of decisions where teams locate is determined by the, their board of governors, which is all the owners. And uh, they did approve a temporary relocation of the Bulldogs. And uh, for, you know, an owner can't say, I'm going to, I'm permanently in the city of Brantford until such time as the OHL board of governors give their consent. So it's like the chicken and the egg thing. And uh, the OHL board of governors you know, they're not inclined to to grant permanent, um, my understanding is not to, to grant permanent pos uh, permission until they see that a community is working towards an OHL appropriate arena. So it's kind of like a chicken and the egg thing. Um, but uh, Mr. Andelar has made it clear, not just to me, but also publicly to the spectator and expositor reporters, how pleased the organization is with uh, their reception here. Um, and I think his words to the Hamilton Spectator reporter were that, uh, although he's pretty occupied in Ottawa right now with things that are happening there with the senators, that uh, if this community proceeds with a, an arena, I think his words and the spectator were uh, probably they would be there to support us. And I think given uh, the stage that we're at and they're at, I mean, you really couldn't expect him to say more than that. Uh, he's a smart businessman and uh, you don't be a smart businessman by making rash decisions. You know, you you properly consider a move like this. But anyway, so far, no question has been very positive. So that's, hope that answers your question. Uh, any other uh, second time? Okay, let's have the vote please, Mr. Clerk. Item 5.1 carries unanimously on a recorded vote of 10 to 0. Members of Council voting in favor are as follows. Councillor Solvents, Les McCreary, Van Tulborg, Samuel Carpenter, Marn Caputo, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. All right. Uh, so we'll move to bylaws, first and second reading. Councillor Sullivan, if you could move the motion for circuit, first and second reading of the bylaws to uh, confirm uh, the decisions we made tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Caputo. That lead be given to the mover and secretary to introduce the following bylaws for first and second reading. Bylaw 1, 2024. Bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Brantford with respect to the special City Council meeting held on January 23rd, 2024. All right, I'll now call the vote on first and second reading. The first and second reading of bylaw 1 2024 carries unanimously on a recorded vote of nine to zero members of council voting in favor are as follows councillor solvent Les mccreary van tilborg samuel caputo marn carpenter and mayor davis all right so we'll move then to third reading councillor caputo i think you've got the resolution for third and final reading thank you mr mayor moved by myself seconded by councillor sullivan that all bylaws having received a first and second reading be taken as read a third time and finally passed and signed by the mayor and clerk. Right, if I can get a vote then in the third reading. The third reading of all bylaws carries unanimously in a vote of nine to zero. Members of council voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Solvent, Les McCreary, Van Tulborg, Samuel Carpenter, Marn, and Mayor Davis. All right, so this uh, city council is now adjourned until next Tuesday at 6.30.